So thanks for everybody coming out tonight. I appreciate it. I've only been in Colorado for about a year and a half. My husband's been here for about three and a half years, but I had to wait till I got my 30 years in before I could retire and move from New Mexico up here. So we had the pleasure of a long distance relationship for a long time. But I've worked for four different agencies, the Forest Service, I've worked for Fish and Wildlife Service, the Department of Defense, and the National Park Service was my last agency position. I've worked in all kinds of settings and all kinds of environments. And I'm going to be talking about, from a wildlife perspective, really the importance of having snags in your neighborhood and in your green belts. One thing I will mention, I volunteer several times a week for a place called Greenwood Wildlife Rehab Center, which is between Lyons and Longmont, Colorado. Down here we kind of have a picture of a brush pile uh, beside a snag. Brush piles uh, have values too. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but we did have a animal brought in from the Red Feather Lakes area almost maybe six to eight weeks ago, and it was a young yellow-bellied marmot. The mom had put in a nice nest inside a brush pile. Well, the gentleman, probably not even thinking, he set fire to that brush pile. The baby that we rescued, and we named him Smokey, managed to crawl out of the brush pile, but the rest of the family perished, unfortunately. Now, he felt really bad about that, so he rushed the animal to us, and he's doing great. He's probably now about four or five pounds, and he's eating and eating, putting on those nice layers of fat. So he'll probably be released back into the wild in probably another two to four weeks. So just another part of the whole cycle of the value of dead wood for wildlife. A researcher, a forest ecologist by the name of Dr. Jerry Franklin, uh, he still, he was with the Forest Service as a researcher. He worked at Oregon State. Now he's at the University of Washington. But he, uh, this is one of his famous quotes, a dead tree is more alive than a live tree. And there's a lot to be said about that. I'm not this is just to kind of show you uh, a real variety of the animals that actually are involved with living and utilizing dead trees. Bats are a huge component. Forest bats are a huge component that use snags in the environment. And that last one is a pine marten there in the center. Anyway, let's just talk about the numbers. When you have snags, large downed trees and the other type of woody debris that really equates with high biodiversity. In North America there are 85 species of birds that are cavity nesters. In the western United States 72 of those 85 species can be found. So it's quite a number uh, of species that use it. This doesn't even account of all the other species that utilize snags for other purposes and I'll get to that in a second. In most studies that I was able to find that took place across the country, kind of this 24 was kind of a good mean. I saw as few as maybe 15 mammals, but as high as almost 40 mammals that utilize snags, large down logs, as well as brush piles. And a great majority of those, depending on what part of the country you are, again, are forest bats. Now in Colorado, especially northern Colorado, in these higher elevation forested environments, we really actually don't have that many amphibian reptiles that are closely linked with dead wood uh, habitats. Uh, best as I could probably muster, we probably have fewer than 10 species that could fall in this category. So things like salamanders, some snakes, those things would be more associated with aquatic environments uh, or very moist environments. Now when we get down to insects and spiders and ants and butterflies and on and on, it's really probably untold, but I would probably venture there's hundreds or probably even thousands of species, the really small invertebrates, that use these types of uh, habitat features. They are a particularly critical source of food during the winter, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. So let's kind of look at the cycle about how snags form from a living tree to a dead tree. The real cycle for getting cavities are our friends, the woodpeckers. They are definitely the cavity creator. Now some cavities can get formed by other means like lightning strikes, 
just broken branches from wind, storms, and those types of things. The woodpecker is the king. Without the woodpeckers in the system, you're not going to get the vast, broad uh, numbers of wildlife that use snags, and, and when they fall over, that translates into other organisms that use them when they're on the ground. Woodpeckers are called primary cavity nesters. They're physiologically built for cavity excavation. They have these very stout, chisel-shaped bills. They have these very stiff tail feathers that help them brace against trunks of trees. They have a very spongy type of bone that encases their brain. It is from slow motion cameras that have been done Woodpeckers will actually drill and pound and drum anywhere from five to 15,000 times a day, especially during the beginning of the breeding season, because that's a real cue for attracting mates and to warn other males to stay out of your territory. Their toes, actually, most birds have three that go forward and one in the rear. Woodpeckers have two that go forward and two that go back. So that really enables them to cling on these vertical surfaces. And another feature, even though you would think they would be, they would take to nest boxes, they don't. This is one group of species that will very rarely use a nest box. So sticking up nest boxes won't bring in cavity nesters in, onto your property or green belts. And another key thing is that woodpeckers will drill multiple holes every year. So they have that cumulative effect on the snags that are found in your neighborhood and in your area. So it's a real multiplier effect. There's, I mean, all woodpeckers excavate, but the larger woodpeckers, that was a red-headed, the northern flicker. This is a hairy woodpecker. You can see all those wonderful insects that he's carrying and feeding, so he's doing his job. A Williamson sapsucker. And then really kind of one of the kings is the Lewis's woodpecker. It's an extremely brightly plumaged bird. Lewis's woodpeckers and redhead woodpeckers uh, are actually on a really severe decline because now these birds are anywhere from 10 to close to 12 inches in length, so they're quite a large bird. We don't have any pileated woodpeckers in Colorado. That's the king of the cavity nesters. When I lived in Minnesota, when you saw a tree where a pileated woodpecker was putting in cavities, they would be as big as this sheet of paper. They're huge, they're just gargantuan. But this is kind of a king around here that does it, and they're not, this is also not a bird that will readily take to suburban, urbanized areas very well, so it does need these larger tracts of naturalized lands. Now, what comes in after our cavity creators have gone is what we call secondary cavity users. So literally hundreds of bird species are involved in the use of these trees and I'm going to sort of go through, I have a diagram coming up that will kind of show you how snags get partitioned. But we have bluebirds, we have chickadees, uh, different swallow species, nuthatches, wrens, different smaller owls as well as great horned owls, kestrels and other birds of prey. So that's the western bluebird, mountain chickadee, and we got a red-breasted nuthatch here. Ducks, not so much here because they're sort of riparian or along ponds and lakes, but wood ducks and other duck species. Flycatchers, uh, goes on and on. I listed some of the most common mammals that you would be likely to see, squirrels, bats again, raccoons, martens, fishers, porcupines, bears, coyotes, foxes, it goes on and on. So mesocarnivores, the middle-sized carnivores, snags and fallen logs are really critical for them. So here's sort of a schematic of a large sized snag. So let's kind of look at, we kind of look a little bit like who can utilize things. Let's look at how they can utilize things. Well, the tops of these trees is, can be used for the platform nests of really large birds of prey like osprey, bald eagles. It's a critical thing for observing where your prey are. It's looking for predators that might be coming after you. There's a variety of uses. We see this sort of a split broken top. That kind of a scenario is great for nesting great horned owls. These snags are used for food storage, not just squirrels. There's a variety. There's a, we don't have any in Colorado. I think maybe in the far, far southern part of the state. But in 
huge wood oak woodlands, you have a species of woodpecker called acorn woodpecker. So if you've ever been in a ponderosa pine forest or that's surrounded with a lot of gambles oak or an oak woodland and you see snags, they'll have literally hundreds of little holes pecked in in acorn woodpecker's cache, an individual acorn in every little hole. That's a critical place for them to store food for the winter. And so it's a really spectacular and ingenious mechanism that birds have evolved to do. So we have another feature of a snag. You've got loose bark. You have big plates of bark that get loose and then they eventually slough off. Bats, that's a critical place for bats. Forest bats actually do not form huge colonies like you think of at Carlsbad Caverns or mines or under bridges where there's millions and millions or hundreds of thousands of bats. Forest bats are solitary or they live in very, very, very small colonies of maybe just a handful of bats. So this is a really critical feature of snags that provide roosting. That's where moms will go when they're going to give birth to their pups. So that's a really critical feature. And usually only the really large snags can provide that kind of sloughing in the plates for them to hide under. Then we have foraging sites in the wood and the cracks and the bark. This is a brown creeper. Probably have quite a few around here, but they, they're famous for kind of like corkscrewing around the bark. They'll, they'll, they'll use live trees as well, but on dead trees, they will just be poking in every little crack and crevice hunting for insects. We're getting down to the bottom. Now, you're, nobody can tell what this is, and that's all right. I try to do it to scale, but that's a tiger salamander. And they live in these moisture environments where you have a lot of debris and kind of almost a mulch that forms at the base of big snags on large fallen logs and that type of thing. Then in some of your largest trees, you're going to get these sort of basal cavities. Again, when snow starts to build up, bears, wolverines, other lynx, a lot of other species will use that to burrow into that and they'll actually live in the winter in these big cavities with the snow protecting and giving them an insulation. And here we have a cinnamon colored black bear that's probably either going after honey honeycomb or who knows nestlings or even eggs. You know, why should you care? Why should I care? Why should any of us care? Snags and large down material, brush piles, especially the large snags, that is really a key to improving, enhancing the wildlife diversity in an area. Again, your guys are next door to a national forest and you would think, oh, well, there's plenty there. The private landowner by far holds much more land for management than anything that the federal government actually owns in terms of property or state governments. So it really is up to private land stewards to make their mark and think about what they're doing when they're managing, even on your small, you know, maybe an acre or two lot. It all has an imp cumulative impact. Of the cavity nesting birds, 80% or more of their diet is actually composed of insects. So they can do a lot of good in your immediate vicinity around your home or in your whole collective subdivision. And we all know that bats are just kings of eating insects. I mean, they literally almost eat their entire body weight every night when they fly out. They provide a much more appealing, the native habitat feature. So I know people, and I've had this living in the de Chihuahuan Desert of southern New Mexico. My parents experienced it in living in Silver City. But the drumming of flickers, of northern flickers, uh, or raccoons or foxes trying to utilize your barns or sheds or around areas around your home. Well, if you have appealing features that are actually what they want to use, that's what they're going to prefer to use. Woodpeckers are notorious. The drumming is a really critical genetic drive that they have to make that noise to attract a mate or scare away another male out of their territory. They have a snag or something, a hollow wooden post of some kind, they want to make that loud noise. That's what, you know, they're not going after insects or bugs in your house or your barn. Well, unless your barn is practically falling down and it's full of larva. But uh, in general, you know, they want to make that noise. They want to announce to the world that they're there. And they are homes. They're homes for literally hundreds of animals. And I think one thing I 
was talking with my husband, he's also an ecologist. We were thinking about the question is, you know, these are legacy features on our landscape. Consider them your great-grandparents. You know, they've lived a long, fruitful life, and now it's sort of the end of that life cycle. Do you just toss your grandparents aside or your elderly parents? You know, so I kind of looked at it in, in terms of that as what can we see on the landscape that really kind of tells a story. To get a large snag can take hundreds of years, and a really good snag that died naturally is going to be on the landscape for decades. And so there is this sort of heritage to think, where did a tree like this, you know, maybe took two to 300 years to form and now is going to be on the landscape for several more decades? What happened in the United States over the life of that tree and now snag? Now, I know you guys don't have wood ducks here, but I just love wood ducks. We've, at the Wildlife Rehab Center, we've gotten in several groups of baby wood ducks and we're getting close to being able to release them. I did have a quote in here. I kind of alluded to it earlier, talking about the value of private lands and stewardship. Kind of the question is, can we and can you afford to provide some wood for wildlife habitat, to leave some dead or dying trees as well as a few hollow logs on every area? Considering the many rewarding values of wildlife that depend on this resource, the question might better be phrased, can you afford not to do this? So this is just some awe type of pictures. There was a gentleman in uh, Kentucky, his name was Charles L. And now, it was kind of scary, it was 25 years ago when he stated this. But he said, dying in dead wood provides one of the greatest resources for animal species in a natural forest. If fallen trees and slightly decayed trees are removed, the whole system would lose at least uh, close to a quarter of its fauna. So that's kind of the, the end of my talk. We can hold questions until the end. Now, these are very long URLs. These are from several places across the country, but they tell a lot about how you can create snags. There's even one of the publications, they talk about even relocating a snag. There's a way to do that, so long as it's not, you know, talking two feet off the, lawn, off the ground, but that could be something to consider if you have a particularly spectacular snag. There are ways to move a snag, just shift it away so it's a place that it can remain for the rest of its sort of life.